Greetings, everyone. My name is Julie Masters, and welcome to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, today we have reached the final episode of our special series of Power Cuts. I I hope these small supercharged doses of content have kept you connected and inspired over this Christmas and New Year period, while myself and the Inside Influence team have been stocking up on turkey, binging on Netflix, and generally refueling our creative tanks. Over the past five weeks, we have cherry-picked some of the best insights and tools from our favorite guests over the past year, all with one intention, to give you some fuel for what Whatever it is you're thinking right now for the year ahead. And for that reason, for our final power cut, I chose the insights of Laura Gassner Oting. Laura is an entrepreneur who started her career as a campaign staffer for the Clinton administration before diving into the world of executive search, rising to the position of senior vice president of startup execsearches.com. Now, it was through her work in executive search that Laura started to notice something. She started to notice that leaders who successfully pivoted either their careers or their lives all had four decisions in common, a sense of calling, connection, contribution, and control. These these realizations went on to become the basis of her 2019 Washington Post bestseller, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. Now, just for a moment. How's that for a mantra for 2022? I'm, I'm taking that one with me everywhere that I go. Now, in this flashback to our conversation, Laura dives into why following your passion is a terrible idea. You have to bear with me on that one. Including her theory of consonants, which is the key to unlocking potential and gauging whether or not we're on the right track. Now, if you don't know what consonants means, don't worry. Neither did I. I'll let Laura explain it in more detail, but in a nutshell, it's that feeling of flow, that sense of flow that comes when the work that you are doing aligns with who you actually are at your core, when what you are putting out in the world matches who you are in the world. Now, after a year of paying close attention to boundaries and borders and social distancing, the distance between us and another human being, our ability to be able to cross over geographically with family, paying so much attention to the boundaries in our lives. This idea of being limitless feels like a massively important idea to explore right now. So I hope it helps you tap into a sense of expansion in your life. And for however long you're able to, sitting with the question, what would I do? What would I create? Who would I be if I were truly limitless? On that note, I will leave you in the very safe hands of Laura Gassner Oten. I think what it takes is having a conversation with yourself about that goal, that dream, that idea that you have that you're like, if only I could, wouldn't it be great if, man, I wish that there was a way to, right? Like those ideas, I, I can tell you that over the years, like you, I'm sure, have had plenty of people who have called me up to get my advice about things. And I can tell you that the ones who are going to achieve what they want, they're so clear to me because they're the ones who have so much respect for their goal. They're so cowed by it that they 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 almost can't even say it out loud. It's like they kind of whisper it with this reverence. And you can kind of tell that they look at it. We hear all the time, like, follow your passion. And um, as I write about a Limitless, I think follow your passion is the world's worst advice. I think it's the spoken word, illegitimate sister of the live, love, laugh tattoo. It is just, it is like this idea and it's 
you know, it's, 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 it's forced upon us with all the social media. Also, we talked about earlier, it's this idea that as soon as you find your passion, everything's going to be smooth sailing. Everything's going to be great. No problem. Easy peasy. And the truth is that your passion is going to gut you. It's going to tear you apart. It's going to throw you down and lift you back up. And it's going to just like, it's going to kill you before it actually lets you see its beauty. And it's the people who don't just follow their passion, but are willing to invest in it. There's not a pill. You're going to have to do the work. You have to have the conversations. You have to mess up. You have to be scared. You have to know that you are on like the bleeding edge of your incompetence because that's where you figure things out. That's where the magic happens. But you you can't do that if you don't let yourself dream really big. And you can't do it if you let yourself be limited by what other people think you're capable of, because nobody knows what you can really do. And I think it's in those moments when we admit to ourselves what maybe we really, really want. I also think it's it's worth pointing out here <clears throat> that you just said at the bleeding edge of your incompetence, and not the bleeding. No, I think it's really, it's, it's worthy of just investigating this for a moment because you didn't just say at the bleeding edge of your competence, which is what I think a lot of people might have heard just then. You, you're not at the bleeding edge of your, edge of your, your competence. This is not being comfortably uncomfortable. This is not, you know, a comfortable version of struggle. This is the bleeding edge of your incompetence. This is when you go way past your competence into a world where you are flailing. Go to the edge of that. And that is where it is. It, that is where it is. It's it's very interesting to me. I, I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs um, and whenever I speak in, entre- like I, I will speak to in entrepreneurship um, business courses and there'll always be somebody in the back of the room who will hear my story and they're like, well, when you, when you dropped out of law school and joined that campaign, what were you going to do if you didn't win and you didn't end up in the White House? Or um, when you when you when you had that moment of rage and you started your own business, what would you do if you didn't succeed? Or, you know, there were always these questions like, what would you do if you didn't succeed? And so I turned the question back and I'm like, well, you're a, you know, self-identified entrepreneur in in waiting. You're sitting here in an entrepreneurship event or conference or class you've got an idea, right? You want to start a business. They're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm like, all right, well, what will you do if you fail? And they always know the answer. The answer is I, I've, I've got six months of savings or I'll move back in with my parents or I'll go get another job in a cubicle until I can, you know, come up with another plan. They always know their plan. So I'm like, all right, so this is the real question. What will you do if you succeed? And I have been asking this question for the last five years and it is always crickets. They never have an answer. And I think what happens is we spend so much time being, quote unquote, comfortably uncomfortable, right? We're in on the bleeding edge of our competence. We don't go any further because like we're afraid. We don't know what's going to happen. We're like, we're not so sure. And we're planning. What if I fail? But we never actually spend time thinking about what if I succeed? And that holds us back from actually succeeding. Does it start with, because I'm just thinking while you're talking, you know, Part of it for me when I've hit that and I've been in the, on the bleeding edge of my own incompetence more than I've ever been in my competence, I think, um, or at least it feels that way, that it starts for me in those moments where you catch that voice. And again, you know, we'll go back to that voice in your head. You catch that voice in your head saying something like, I couldn't have that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't make an impact there. I couldn't make a difference here because dot, 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 fill in the blank. But the the catching of those moments where, you know, you suddenly you see a limitless opportunity or you see that moment, you've trained your brain to, to, to go for opportunity and then something else happens and that voice, it's quick and it's often quiet, but it is so powerful and it shuts, shuts down a part of your brain, that resourceful, curious part of your brain. When you hear that, or if you can catch that, cause it's so fast, if you can catch it, what comes next? Well, you know, my favorite quote from um, Eleanor Roosevelt, former first lady to, to, to FDR here in the U.S., uh, and it's hard to pick one because it's like picking your favorite child. But my favorite quote of hers is, you'd worry much less about what other people thought of you if you realized how seldomly they did. <laughs> so I think a lot of times that voice comes from the, oh, my God, I might embarrass myself or I can't do it or it's not going to work. And then what? And then what? And the truth is then nothing. Nobody cares. Nobody's paying that much attention. Nobody is 
focusing on you because everyone else is worrying so much about what everyone else thinks of them that they're forgetting to actually look at you. Like we're all having the same problem. It's pluralistic ignorance, but it's like the other direction, right? Where we're all just like, oh my God. So um, how do you shut the voice down? I think you shut the voice down by remembering that failure is not finale. It's not the end of the line. It's not like, it does not mean everything's over. There's always more options. Failure is fulcrum. It's actually the place where you learn and you grow and you shift and you change. I want to, I want to focus in on, on the word consonants. It's a big, big part of your book. Um, this word, and it was a new word for me. It was a word that I, that I hadn't heard before. I had to Google it and, and read its definition and, and kind of familiarize myself with it. So can you, why is this one word so important to, to you, what you do and, and the kind of the nuclear atom of the book? You know, it's funny because people say to me, oh, I've never heard that word before, but we've all heard dissonance, right? We've all heard its opposite, cacophony, noise, organ rejecting, you know, organ rejection. Uh, it, it, it is, we know what it feels like when things aren't working. And the opposite of dissonance is consonance. It's alignment, it's flow, it's harmony. And in the book, I talk about it, you know, about how it's what you do matching who you are. It's when, it's when, you know, those moments when you just feel like, you feel like the very best of what you do is being called upon to solve a problem that you actually care about. And you're being rewarded for solving that problem in a way that's meaningful to you. I mean, it could be money. It could be um, uh, uh, manifesting your values on a daily basis. It could be, um, uh, you know, networking with friends. It could be solving a problem, right? It's like, it is, it is the moment when you feel like you can walk through walls. You can leap over tall buildings. You're just, you are in the zone. And we do our best work when we're in consonants. We do our best work when the best of what we can do is being called for to solve a problem that's meaningful to us. And we're being rewarded for in ways that we actually care about. And so few of us have that in our work life because we're resigned to feel like we can't pursue that because we have to pursue this idea of success as built by everybody else. And then we get there, we get to the top and we're like, well, the top of what? Like this isn't, this is all I have now is just more stress, right? Like the higher you go, it, it gets harder and harder. And so my, my wish for people who read the book is to figure out not what success looks like externally, right? Like what do the Kardashians tell us that we should be doing? Who cares, right? There are these ideals that are being put out that are in front of us that just don't feel right. Like they just, they, they feel dissonant to who we are. I use the word consonance because it, it really is the thing that I want people to achieve is this harmony, this alignment, this flow. And it stems back from my days doing executive search when people would say, look, we want somebody who went to an Ivy League school, uh, super articulate, who can raise tons of money, who's a perfect manager. Like they just give a laundry list of quote unquote great traits of a CEO or of a leader. And I'm like, okay, what kind of personality are they going to have? And will it be consonant with your organization? Or when they get here, is it going to be like, what's like, who record scratch moment. And so I always talked about talent as needing to be a sort of a, a, a consonant thing also. And I, I can really speak to that from, you know, you talked about your background in executive search and, and my background in finding talent to sign to a, a management agency. And I, I always had these moments and I'm sure you had the same where you, you see somebody, you either see them on LinkedIn, you, you, you hear about them and they're at the top of their game. You know, they are the authority in this particular field. They've done these incredible things. They, people speak so highly of them. And then I would go and seek them out as a speaker or go and seek them out to, to become like an influencer in their field. And I would talk to them. And in some occasions, the level of disconnect from who they were, like who they were in the moment and what they had done, you could tell that, you know, you've done these amazing things, but you feel zero passion for this. You feel zero to use your word, which was so beautiful. You, use, you feel zero reverence towards what you're doing here or why you're doing it. And because of that, the influence that you can have, the impact that you're able to have is dramatically reduced. I can't, I can't put you out there into the world. You'll have, you'll have very little impact and which is such a shame because you've done so many incredible things. Yeah. It's funny when I, uh, when I used to walk into potential clients offices, 
and tell them about our firm and the work that we did and why we did the work they did, more often than not, I would get a reaction, which went something like, wow, you really love what you do. Or, oh my gosh, your confidence about how you do this work and the solution that you can provide is contagious. And, you know, I would always be like, of course I love my work. I have the best team in the world. We're doing the best work in this field. Like I am proud of what we do. I'm passionate about it. And more often than not, we sold the deal because when you are so passionate and you are so real and your client can tell that you are going to take their problem into your arms and it will become your shared problem until the problem goes away. They can't help but want to get on board with that. And I used to tell people that would come to work for me all the time, like, we're not selling talent. We're not selling our database. We're not selling our process. We're selling trust. At the 10 year mark, there was actually a moment where I didn't do that very well. And it's just, this is a story that doesn't reflect very well on me, but I was literally like doing the research on the potential client on the elevator on the way up to see him. I had just like, I had lost my passion. I wasn't as excited. I still was able to fake it. I still went in. I, I faked it really well. I, I, I was my usual, you know, brand of like, or my usual combination of like wisdom about the field and a little bit of moxie about the fact that we were doing work a little bit different than the way our competitors did. And, and, and I knew how to play the part. I didn't, my heart wasn't in it. And we sold the work, but in the elevator on the way down, I texted my business partner on like, but not because it should have. And I think we should have a conversation about whether or not I'm still in this game. Like, I think maybe it's time for this firm to have different leadership because that was unfair to everybody in this firm. And I should not have done that. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and have seized hold of at least one tool, idea or mindset that will help you start raising your own level of influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your journey or would just love a roadmap to becoming the most influential voice, idea or brand in your space, then I have good news. You can now download the latest updated version of my ebook, The Influencer Code, from my website, juliemasters.com. Also, there's a link in the show notes. Just pop in your email address, and I promise I will not spam you, but it is jam-packed full of ideas, tools, and case studies that I have come across in my now 20-plus years of doing this work, not to mention the seven areas and seven core questions that I have found to be hands down the most valuable when it comes to immediately lifting your ability to make an impact. Download it, keep it, share it, juice it for all it is worth. I hope it makes a massive difference in both your career and your business. Thank you always to my co-founder and the main brain behind this podcast, Lauren Kelly. You kick my butt in all the right ways. Thank you for making it happen. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure that you never miss an episode.